seat you here. We are thankful to be here. We're excited about what the Lord has in store. I'm excited about our worship. I'm excited about the message, but most importantly, I'm excited to see you here. The psalmist writes in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be here. This is something that I look forward to each and every week, and uh, I am glad to see uh, that you made this a part of your week to come and worship the Lord and be with God's people in God's house, and uh, we're just looking forward to what's going to take place here this morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church, our Sunday morning worship service. My name is Tracy Smith. I'm pastor here. If you're visiting with us, thank you. You are a very special and welcome guest of ours, and we hope that you will take the time during the course of this service and fill out one of the visitor information cards if you haven't already. Uh, give that to me on the way out. Uh, also, we have the opportunity for you to invite other people. There are plenty of these uh, invitation cards with our church information on it. it has our service times, uh, our address, phone number, and uh, there's even a QR code on the back that they can scan. It'll take them to our website and give them the rest of the information on all of our ministries here. One of the things that we're involved in right now, we are now entering to our week of prayer uh, for our annual Georgia Barnett State Mission Offering. And so every penny of this goes into different uh, ministries here in our state. Uh, it goes into disaster relief. It goes into church planning. Uh, just a number of things, and every bit of that goes into ministries right here in our state. Last week we looked at a video that came from Point O'Shan after uh, Hurricane Ida and the recovery effort that's going there. And so this morning we have another video we want to show you about where those Georgia Barnett offerings go to. Waiting. It's something we don't like to do. Stuck on the interstate? Waiting for a check. Waiting for vacation. We wait in our own frustration for relaxation or an explanation, an important conversation or inspiration. But there's another kind of waiting there is waiting in the fields, waiting for the seeds, waiting for a sign of life. To see the good soil, a reward for the toil, and green sprouts to appear in the rows. As we look across the fields of Louisiana, the fields of the lost, hopeless, and afraid, they are there. We aren't waiting on them. Whether anyone knows it or not, they are waiting for us. They are waiting in the dark and sometimes in the rain. They are waiting and wondering if there is relief for their pain. The process is mystery, but the harvest is a certainty. And our response to God's call will determine our history. Will we stand by and wait or will we go? Louisiana is waiting for us. for you as well. We pray for you. We have prayed specifically for this service. There is a prayer request card uh, in the back of the pew in front of you. We want to know how we can pray for you as well. So uh, we're here for our community. We're here for our neighbors. We're here for our friends. But we're here this morning to worship the Lord. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders. Uh, we have a youth fellowship coming up next Saturday, September the 14th at the home of Josh and Chantel Brunet from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock. So uh, invite your friends, students, this is for you. This is an opportunity for you to get together and fellowship. Uh, we're going to have a good time. We're going to have some food. We're going to have some games. We're going to have some activities planned for you. So please come be a part of that. Uh, also on the 19th of September, uh, Thursday night at 6 o'clock, our Louisiana Baptist Singing Men will be here uh, live. They will put on a worship uh, concert for you. Uh, it will be something that they will minister to you through music. Uh, they will involve you in their worship, and uh, you don't want to miss this. Invite this. This is open to the public. Uh, they will take up a love offering for a scholarship fund that they are involved in. 
so please be here for that. Fall food roundup, the list is in the foyer. And also youth, don't forget about YEC, Youth Evangelism Celebration. Uh, that is going to be on Sunday and Monday, November the 24th and 25th. I'll get some more information to you about that. Let's all stand. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord, uh, praising worship and letting the overflow of our heart uh, just spring forth during this service is what this is all about. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get started. Father God, we just love you so much. Uh, what a great opportunity to be here today, Lord God. Uh, just to fellowship with other believers, uh, to sing praises to your name, but also to be fed from the word of God. So we pray that you'll speak to our hearts today, Lord God. And as we look at these videos of how we can be a part of different ministries throughout our state and our community, Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to engage people, not only uh, through our offerings, but also through our actions, Lord God. Each and every day, we have an opportunity to impact the life of someone who may not know you as their Lord and Savior. But today, Lord God, this is just a reflection. This is an overflow from our hearts. And we want to just let you know, Lord God, that we're here for one reason and one reason only, and that's to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Let your power and your presence be felt by everyone here. And, Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, let today be that day that they step out in faith, acknowledge their sin, accept you as their Lord, and begin a new life. And we just ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Find somebody you haven't said hello to yet and tell them how glad you are that they are here today. the cross of Jesus.
Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 26. There is... Can't read. There is none like unto God. Let's sing how great thou art. This is our offering.
Thank you for each person here today. Bless them and make them feel present that they can feel your presence here and pass it on to their families. Lead us and guide us as we worship you that we can listen and hear the word that you want us to hear. Be with each tithe and an offering that's taken up that it might further your work. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. church can you say amen this morning amen. If you have your bibles this morning we will be in the book of numbers chapter 21 numbers chapter 21 on sunday nights uh, six o'clock we're going through a series right now on the book of hebrews and last sunday night we got to a part in chapter two where the writer of Hebrews, now we're, we're kind of discussing who the actual author of Hebrews is. We know that God through the Holy Spirit inspired a person to write this book, but in the book of Hebrews, the author does not give himself away. He doesn't say who it is. 
Uh, that many people have tried to guess who it is. We've looked at internal evidence. We've looked at external evidence. But whoever it is that wrote the book of Hebrews, if you'll be here tonight at 6 o'clock, we're kind of exploring those possibilities. But in Hebrews chapter 9, verse uh, 9, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, excuse me, here's one thing he says and kind of kind of woke me up, kind of clued me in to where he was headed and kind of made me think about places that we see Jesus. It says that we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned him with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Now we clearly see Jesus Christ in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. That means that they saw things pretty much in the same way. John is a little bit different because he writes about different aspects about Jesus' life and his ministry here on this earth. So we also see Jesus also in the Old Testament. Now there are some clear messianic prophecies all throughout the Old Testament where it clearly refers to a coming Messiah. On that day he will return. There's many different places, over 300 places where the uh, birth, the death, the life, and the resurrection of Jesus were accurately predicted. Some of them over 750 years before Jesus was even born. But there are also some places in Scripture where we see pictures of Jesus. It doesn't necessarily point to a coming Messiah or a Savior. But through the story and through looking at the story and what it represents, we see a picture of Jesus painted out through something that actually took place. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I, I, I would suggest that you just put your phones away for a little while, even if you're reading your Bible on your phone. Maybe get the Bible that is in the back of the pew in front of you. Uh, so you can kind of minimize the distractions. If you haven't silenced your phones already, uh, please do so and just put them away for a little while. Pull up a chair, uh, get comfortable, and open up your Bible. And let's look at Numbers 21, beginning in verse 4. Uh, let's all stand as we read God's Word. So the children of Israel are nearing the tail end of their journey through the wilderness, and we see this situation come up. And I know that they're at the tail end of their journey because they have already Explained multiple times about the situation that they are in. And this is another situation. This is actually the eighth time that they have made some type of a grumbling or complaint towards Moses against what's going on in their lives. Beginning in verse 4, we see this. Then they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. A desperate situation. People were complaining. People were grumbling. God's judgment came upon them. So the, uh, the situation was extreme. It was severe. Many people were dying. But the solution was so, so simple. We see a picture here painted of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death on the cross for the sins of mankind. Folks, the situation today is very, very serious, and there are still many people who believe salvation cannot be that simple. This is a picture clearly of the situation that we are in today with our nation being infected with sin, the entire world infected with sin, and God is still presenting the solution to them. If you will only turn and look to me, when you see Jesus, 
you will know that that is my solution to the problem that you are in. Father God, we thank you so much for this day and for all that you're doing. God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for our provision for us. God, help us to always have hearts filled with gratitude and gratefulness, thankfulness for what you blessed us with. But most of all, Lord, help us to take the good news of the gospel, the simple news that Jesus saves, the simple news that you gave your one and only son in our place as a solution for sin. We pray that this message would seep and deep into our hearts. And we just pray, Lord God, that you'll guide us through this time and help us to use this as a way, Lord God, to share our faith with others and as an inspiration and motivation for us to share with others. And we just ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Four specific things I want you to see out of this passage that point towards the situation that we are in today and the provision that God has made for that problem through his son, Jesus Christ. One of the first things that we see is that they had a heart that was discouraged. They didn't trust in God's ability to provide for them. Verse number four says that they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. Let me tell you something, folks. When you go in any other direction besides the path that the Lord has prepared for you, when you go on any other path that leads you away from the Lord Jesus Christ, when you take a detour around God's plan for your life, guess what? You're going to be discouraged. That's the first point that I want you to see here. Not trusting in God's ability left them feeling discouraged, and it will leave you feeling discouraged as well. This group of people that they were trying to avoid, the Edomites, who were they? They were the descendants of Esau. The Israelites were descendants of Jacob. Jacob stole the birthright from Esau many, many, many years before this particular story. Guess what? There was still bad blood between these two groups. Even though Jacob and Esau had made peace with each other, they buried the hatchet, but they left the handle sticking out. And these two groups were still harboring bitter feelings towards each other. And now the Israelites were trying their best to avoid them, so they went way, way around the country that they were in. Let me ask you this. Is there anybody right now that you're avoiding? Is there anybody right now that makes you feel discouraged? Is there anybody right now that you are harboring bitter feelings toward that you just try to stay away from them? The sight of them just makes your skin curdle, makes your blood boil. Even though maybe you said you're sorry, maybe this person has passed away, maybe they're already deceased and you don't have that opportunity to make amends with them. Is there someone right now that you still have hard feelings toward? I think one of the first places that sin develops in is a root of bitterness in a person's life. And until you address that root of bitterness, you will never, ever get over that situation. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. He says, be angry and do not sin. He says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. One sign of sin in a person's heart is a root of bitterness and an unforgiving spirit. Also, one sign of someone who is harboring sin in their heart is that they will go out of their way to avoid certain people or certain groups of people. Are you discouraged today? Is there unforgiveness in your heart? This is what Jesus said in his model prayer, Matthew chapter 6, Verses 14 through 15. Jesus said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you also. But if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you of your trespasses. I think one of the first things that we see that caused the Israelites discouragement is that they harbored unforgiveness in their hearts toward the Edomites. There was bad blood that still existed, and they had not 
yet made peace with them. Next thing we see is that when they took God's provisions for granted, they complained. They had everything that they needed. God was providing them with manna on the ground each and every day as much as they needed for that day. If they ran out of water, if they were camped in a place where there was no water, God brought water from a rock. They never ran out. Sometimes he would make quail fall from the sky when they wanted meat. Every time they complained, every time they came up with an issue, every time they had a need, God provided for them. Several places it's in the Bible it says that they wandered around for 40 years. It said their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. They didn't get calluses on their feet. They didn't get blisters. They didn't get anything like that. Ladies, how many of you would like to have the same pair of shoes for 40 years? Not a single one of you. <laughs> but God provided them in miraculous ways. He provided for them in so many ways, yet still they were unhappy. Look at what verse 5 says. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Guess where the first complaints are usually directed towards? Leadership. You're responsible for the situation that I'm in. You've led us in the wrong way. You don't know what you're doing. They fail to take responsibility for their situation. They said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die here in this wilderness? There's no food, yet God was feeding them every, way, every day. None of them starved to death. As a matter of fact, God said, I'm going to give you so much quail, you're going to have it running out of your nose. You're going to be so full of it. That's the way we are with God. Do you know any complainers? Do you know any grumblers? I don't want to see anybody looking over at uh, their neighbor or punching them with an the elbow or anything like that. We all have that nature in us, though. Man, it's so hot down here. What's going on with this economy? Why is it so bad? Yeah, you've got a roof over your head. You've got a bed to sleep in. You've got a car to drive. Our natural tendency is to take the things that we have for granted. And most of the times when God provides for us in ways that we don't understand, we still complain about it. You know anybody that's a chronic complainer? You had anybody complain to you here lately? Look, I get complaints all the time. I get excuses all the time. I ask people why they don't come to church, and guess what? They come up with all these kind of excuses, and their complaints is what they are. Why don't you come to church? Well, you know, I don't want to sit in them old hard pews. They hurt my back. They hurt my rear end. But yet they'll go sit on a metal bench at a football game for three hours in 95-degree weather with mosquitoes eating them up. <laughs> but they won't come sit in a padded cushion pew where there's air conditioning it's too hot it's too cold the music's too loud people are going to look at me funny you know what I just don't want to go to church because there's too many hypocrites guess what that don't keep you from going to Walmart does it Walmart's full of hypocrites isn't it <laughs> all they are is complaints people just want to mumble they want to bellyache they want to complain and that's exactly what the Israelites were doing. This was God's chosen people. He had given them so many promises and made a covenant with them, yet still all they had to do was complain. You know what? Here's what I find out happens most of the time. When we take our eyes off of Jesus Christ, we start complaining. When we take our eyes off of what the Lord has done for us and when we start putting our eyes on our circumstances, that's usually when the complaining begins. If you remember that, the story from the night on Galilee when, when Jesus asked Peter to come out of the boat and walk on the water with him. Guess what? As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was okay. But when he started looking at the wind and the waves around him, when he started putting his eyes on his circumstances, he started sinking in the water. 
Folks, if you want to have a happy life, if you want to be content with the things that God has blessed you, you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and you let him lead you every step of the way. And don't let your life be filled with complaining and belly aching and grumbling. So this wasn't the first time that the Israelites complained. In the same chapter, chapter 21 and verses 1 through 3, we see that they have just come out of a huge victory. This wasn't the first time they complained. And this was the second major victory that they had while they were in the wilderness. But it was only the second victory since they first entered into the wilderness. The first major victory came against the Amalekites when Moses lifted up the rod and Joshua led the army to defeat the Amalekites at the Battle of Rephidim. But they just came out of their second major victory while wandering around in the wilderness. It was their second victory, but this time of grumbling and complaining, this was their eighth time to grumble and complain. You know what the number eight represents in the Bible? It represents a new beginning. The eighth day of the week starts a new week over again. David was the eighth son of Jesse. The number eight always represents a new beginning. Uh, let, me, let me share something with you about God. We, we talked about this in our Sunday school lesson a lot this morning. God is a patient God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that God is long-suffering. I love that word, long-suffering. 2 Peter 3, 9 says that God is not slack concerning promises, but he's long-suffering towards us. God is a patient God, but even his patience has limitations. They complained once. They complained twice. God said, okay, we're good, we're good. Seventh time complaining, we're okay, we'll get through this. But on the eighth time, God said, you know what? I've had all I could stand to this complaining. And that is when God's judgment came upon the Israelites. Even God's chosen people, his own special nation, God had to carry out judgment upon them because of their complaining. However, God's patience only lasts so long, and then it's time for him to respond with his righteous judgment. How many of you would be, would be honest and tell me today, Brother Tracy, I know that God has been patient with me. Just raise your hand. Has God been patient with you? Aren't you glad that we serve a patient God? And I think God has been patient with our nation, but even that patience has a limitation. And I'm afraid God is about to remove his hand, or he is in the process right now of removing his hand off of our nation because his patience has come to an end. God had had all the complaining he could stand. God, there's no food out here, but I'm giving you manna each and every day. God, there's no water out here. We're dying of thirst. I'll make water come from a rock. We loathe this worthless bread. Have you ever loathed anything in your life? I hope you don't reach that point. But look at what verse 6 brings. God's patience comes to an end, and then God's judgment comes upon the people. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. They bit the people, and many of the people died. Complaint number eight brought God's righteous judgment and a new beginning. Sometimes God allows us suffering, and sometimes God controls our circumstances in order to get our attention and change our direction and change our attitude. God said, you don't like the bread I'm giving you? You don't like the water I'm giving you? Guess what I'm going to give you? I'm going to give you some fiery serpents. We're going to change your attitude just a little bit. You don't like the provisions that I'm giving you to sustain you and keep you alive? I'm going to give you something that's really going to get your attention. Was everyone healed? No. Verse 6 says right here clearly that many of the people of Israel 
died. It's like we studied in our Sunday school lesson this morning. The wages of sin is death. Disobedience, discontentment, complaining, grumbling, going out of God's will and his direction for your life, all of that brings a penalty with it. And the penalty for the Israelites here was that many of them died. Many died before they realized the seriousness of the situation. And many died before they came to Moses confessing their sin. My friend, let me tell you this. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until God's judgment comes upon your life to begin confessing your sins to him. And that goes for a nation as well. Don't wait until it's too late. Church, it's time for us to rise up. The Bible says clearly that judgment begins not at the nation, not at the sinful folks, but judgment begins at the house of God. Have we become too complacent? Have we let too many innocent people die already? Is it time for us to step up and repent and confess of our sins and begin praying for God to put his hand back upon our nation? And hold off on his judgment as well. That's the message that Jonah gave to the Ninevites. He says, 40 days, you got 40 days, and then God's going to wipe you out. God is patient, he's just, but his patience reaches a limit. And eventually his judgment has to come to pass. And in the book of Jonah, they repented from the king all the way down. They came confessing their sins, and here's exactly what happened to the Israelites as well. Not trusting in God's ability left them feeling discouraged, and when they took God's provisions for granted, they complained. Verse number seven is the key here. This is the turning point. When disaster struck, they confessed. The first time they came to Moses, they came complaining. The second time they came to Moses, they came confessing. Have you ever noticed that when something bad goes on in a nation, our church houses are full? How many of you remember what happened after 9-11, the original attack on the Twin Towers? Our churches across our nation was full. People were getting right. They knew something was going on. And I think what we see happening in our nation today, we see these little pockets of revival taking place. People understand that God's judgment is being dished out upon our nation. And now they're coming and they're confessing. My, 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 how the attitudes changes of someone who is in need. I'm going to get on my soapbox here in just a little bit. You can't drag some people to the church house on Sunday morning to come worship the Lord. But let me tell you something, when a need strikes in their life, when it's a disease, a financial need, something like that, they know where the church is then, buddy, and they'll make a beeline straight towards it. Why do we wait until a bad situation occurs to seek the Lord's help? Why do we have to have so many people dying in the desert before we start confessing our sins? When disaster struck, they confessed. Verse number seven says, therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. And they even named their sin. We've spoken out against you and the Lord. Please take away these serpents. When's the last time you've gotten down on your knees and said, God, we have sinned. Would you please take away the sin from our nation. Would you please take away this scourge of sweeping our nation? Would you please heal our land? When is the last time you came to the Lord and fully confessed not only what's going on in your life, but what's going on in the life of your family and your nation and your community? We have sinned. Would you please take away God's judgment that has come upon us. Right here at this point in the life of the nation of Israel, there were approximately 1.5 million people, most people estimate, 
There was a census taken in the book of Numbers. That's how it got its name. And they counted up the men that were of age to fight. And based upon that, they estimate anywhere between 1.5 and 2.5 million people. Right now in our world, 8.2 million. Right here today, I'd say there's probably 55, 60 people here in this sanctuary. We have seen many confessed, but it also says that many died. I wonder how many people here today would be willing to say there's something in my life that I need to repent of. I wonder how many would be willing to say that. But I also wonder how many would only say that if there was a disastrous situation in your life. What is it going to take to bring you to that point of repentance? How many times do I have to preach about hell? How many times do I have to preach about heaven? How many times do I have to preach about the blood that Jesus Christ shed for our sins? Some of you have heard the gospel message dozens of times. Some of you have heard the gospel message since you was a little kid. Some of you have heard it so many times you've become callous to it. You still don't realize the price that was paid for your sins. And it took many people dying here in the desert for these other people to come to Moses and say, we have a problem. We need a solution. What can you do for us? You see, repentance is not saying I'm sorry. Repentance is not saying I got caught. Repentance is not saying I made a mistake. Repentance is giving your life to Jesus when you come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When God puts a finger on a place in your heart and he says, this ain't right. And then when you remove your pride and humble yourself and say, God, I see that this is a problem. What's the solution for it? That's what repentance is all about. Write down this verse, James 4, 6. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I just wonder how many more people would have died if they hadn't have come to Moses and confessed their sins. Write down this verse, Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but Whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Have you experienced God's mercy in your life yet? Is there something in your life right now that you need to confess? My friend, don't put it off any longer. Let today be that turning point in your life when you lay it all out on the altar and say, God, here it is. Here's all of my mistakes. Here's all of my shortcomings. I need a solution. And you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, look to Jesus. There's your solution right there. It's that simple. There's nothing complicated about it. Jesus shed his blood so you can be set free from whatever it is that you're dealing with. And it's only through his death that you can find new life. And here's the solution. Point number four, God's solution was the only way they could be healed. Verses eight through nine. The Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, to put it another way, everyone who is infected with sin when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and so it was if a serpent had bitten anyone, circle that word right there, underline it, because this salvation was for anyone and everyone who would by faith accept God's solution for the problem that they were facing. Anyone, when he looked at it, he lived. Many died because they didn't have a solution. Many died because they walked away and wouldn't look. But many who looked at 
God's solution, were cured and lived. Here's what I want you to know about all that. This next slide kind of summarizes everything. Sometimes all you need to do is give people an opportunity to see Jesus. This three circles that we've been through, it's a way of you demonstrating to someone, giving them a visual illustration. Was there power in that serpent on the pole? Was there power in that statue that Moses made? No, that's not where the power was. Is there power in these three circles that we draw out? No, that's not where the power is. The power comes that when by faith you accept God's free gift of salvation. The power comes through faith. The power comes through God's grace that he wants to pour out upon your life. Ephesians 2.8 says that it is by grace you're saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Moses says, if you've been bitten by this serpent, if you're on your way to your deathbed, here's your solution. The provision has been made, and now the choice is yours. But Satan puts all these temptations in our ways and tries to distract us away from God's solution. You may be here today. You may think that there's no reason to look to Jesus because of something you've done. You say, it's too bad. God won't forgive me. Let me say, yes, he will. There's no sin too great that God can't wipe it out. Sometimes all you need to do is give people an opportunity to see who Jesus is and to see what Jesus has done and to see the provision that God has made for our sins. A snake on a pole? You want me to look at a silly snake on a pole? I'm infected with venom. I'm about to die. And this is the best solution you got for me, Moses? Yeah, it's that simple. I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to take you and unturn your head to make you look at it. You have to do it on your own. The only solution you could come up with is something as simple as looking at a silly statue on a pole. Yeah, that's what God said to do. Here's what the Apostle Paul had to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. He said, the preaching of the cross is unto them who perish foolishness, but it unto, us, unto us who are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. I'm sure that some of those Israelites said, I'm not going to look at some stinking silly snake on a pole. That's childish. That's too simple. But those who looked were healed. Those who took God's prescription for the disease that they had, for the venom that was in their veins, those are the ones who by faith were healed. Preacher, you really expect me to believe this story of people looking at a snake on a pole and that that really happened? Yeah. Preacher, you really expect me to believe that looking to Jesus is the only way that I can be forgiven? Let's see what Jesus had to say about this. Go to John chapter 3. Most of us are familiar with John 3.16. We don't typically look at the verses before and after it. But most of the times when you see Jesus speak about something that happened in the Old Testament, he's putting his stamp of approval on something. Jesus talked about Jonah and how Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights. And Jesus talks about this particular passage in the book of Numbers as well. John chapter 3 Verse 14, listen to what Jesus said. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. 
How many of you are visual learners? Is there anybody here that's a visual? You see a picture, you draw it out, maybe you write it down to help memorize it. Most of us are visual learners. And I think that's why God gives us this picture in words here in the book of Numbers and in the book of John chapter 3. Jesus is putting his stamp of approval on this. He's saying, here's what that serpent on the pole was painting a picture of. He said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Friend, God is not condemning you. Jesus did not die to condemn us to death. Jesus died to save us from our sins and give us eternal life. Have you reached a point in your life where you knew something was not right, where you knew your relationship with the Lord wasn't where it was supposed to be? And have you reached a point in your life to where you said, I'm going to look to Jesus and see what the solution is? Friends, we've all been infected with this thing called sin. The Bible clearly says that the wages of sin is death and that there are none righteous, no, not one, that we've all sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. But Satan throws these temptations into our lives. And sin has a far, far reaching impact. Sin invites, it excites, and it delights but then it ignites. It causes death in your life. Sin thrills, and then it kills. Sin fascinates, and then it assassinates. Sin teases, and then it squeezes. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. Satan wants you to think that what you've done can't be forgiven, and what he's trying to do is trying to keep you distracted off of the solution that God has provided for you. Let me just say this today. If you're struggling with a relationship, if you're harboring unforgiveness in your heart, you look to Jesus. If you're suffering from lust, look to Jesus. If you're suffering from some type of addiction or a habit that is bringing you down, you look to Jesus. Whatever it is that you're dealing with in your life, whatever it is that you're struggling with, the simple act of looking to Jesus as a solution to your problem, that's where you're going to find your answer. Sometimes all you need to do is give people an opportunity to see Jesus and what he's done, where their solution can be found. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Have you been to the cross of Calvary yet with your life? Have you taken all of your sins and your heartaches and laid them down at the feet of Jesus? Have you experienced this brokenness in your life that we've been talking about and tried your best to overcome it, but you still can't find a solution? Just simply look to Jesus. Some of you are still here saying, Brother Tracy, it just can't be that simple. Yes, it is. God is not going to make it complicated for you. But here's the thing I also know is that God is not going to force his will upon your life. If he could, he would. If I could, I would. But God wants you to come willingly 
and accept his mercy and his grace and see that he has made a provision through the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Folks, in just a moment, if you never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would encourage you when the music begins, don't don't hesitate, don't wait. Don't think about getting out of here as fast as you can. Don't think about what you're going to be doing for the rest of the day. Because if you never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you have the most decision in your life that you need to make. I'm not talking about one of many decisions. I'm talking about the single most important decision that you will ever make in your life is where you will spend eternity at. And that decision is all based upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. There's no middle ground. Either you is or you ain't. Either you have Jesus in your life or you don't. Either you're headed to eternity in a place called heaven and you're headed to eternity in a place called hell. And that decision is all based upon what you have or have not done with Jesus Christ. And today I want to let you know it's as easy as saying, God forgive me. Come into my life and make me a new person. I'll be waiting here in the front. If that's a decision that you need to make, I would love to pray with you and talk with you and show you in the Bible what you need to do to begin that relationship. But right now, if you're already a Christian, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would ask you to start praying for those around you right now. And as the music begins to play, whatever it is that God is leading you to do, these altars are open, these front row of pews. You come kneel down to them and you pray and you pour your heart out for God to change those situations in your life that you have no control over. Heavenly Father, we submit this time to you. God, I prayed over this invitation for people to respond and for them to give their lives to you. And I know, Lord God, beyond the shadow of a doubt that there are people here that need a touch from you. Lord, whoever it is, give them the boldness, give them the courage to respond and begin a new life with you. We just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.